thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to come and share my work. Not far, I just work in Kaushland Hall, but it's always a pleasure to be included in these things. So today I'm gonna to give the first uh, of a two-part series of talks on cholera, and we're both gonna be talking about cholera and the interactions with phages. And so I'm gonna start with an introduction to the pathogen. So Vibrio cholera is a gram-negative facultative pathogen that lives in aquatic reservoirs and can emerge to cause disease in humans following the consumption of contaminated food or water. So upon ingestion, the organism actually colonizes the small intestine. There it replicates to very high levels in a very short period of time. It produces key virulence factors, including cholera toxin, which is responsible for the severe diarrhea that follows cholera and severe cholera infection. So the severe diarrhea can be uh, rapidly dehydrating. In fact, a healthy, otherwise healthy human adult can succumb and die because of rehydration within 12 hours of symptom onset. So it can lead to a very severe um, disease if left untreated. So the diarrhea both facilitates the organism's ability to transmit back into the aquatic environment and reseed those reservoirs so that it can be transmitted to, to others, as well as it can be transmitted via fecal-oral contamination directly to other um, hosts. So in terms of the global burden of cholera, it's currently estimated that there are approximately three million cases per year. And this was a paper that was published in 2015. Not surprisingly, being a waterborne disease, we see that cholera is prevalent in many parts of the world where access to clean drinking water and proper sanitation is lacking. This includes many parts of Africa and Asia, as well as you'll notice some regions closer to home in Mexico and Haiti, for example, are included in this graph, which shows um, areas of the world that report cholera to the WHO. This typically, on average, represents approximately 10% of what we imagine the actual burden is. So there's around 250,000 cases reported. Of course, the actual burden is much higher because there's many countries, including regions that I'll talk about today, like Bangladesh, that do not report cholera to the WHO. So this number of three million approximate cases per year can increase dramatically given the right circumstances. You may be aware that we're currently facing the world's greatest outbreak of cholera in modern history. That's going on right now in Yemen. So between April 2017 to the end of December 2017, the case burden in Yemen reached one million cases alone. So given that the theme of the symposium today is about confronting persistent epidemics, I wanted to talk briefly about the history of cholera in the last hundred or so years. So what we know is that cholera, we're currently in the seventh pandemic of cholera, which started officially in 1961 in Indonesia. Prior to the seventh pandemic, there were six known pandemics that started in the beginning of the 1800s. And they were all caused by so-called classical variants or classical strains of cholera. And in the early 1920s, the sixth pandemic classical strains largely stopped causing disease. And what's interesting is that these, these strains ended up disappearing from the aquatic environment as well as from clinical patients over time. During the inter-pandemic period, pre-seventh pre LTOR variants arose through unmediated, we don't know why, that happened, unknown selection pressures. Um, these pre-seventh pre pandemic isolates, LTOR isolates, gave way eventually, starting in 1961, to the currently circulating LTOR variants that are circulating today. Even in the seventh pandemic, what we see are these waves of transmission, where new variants of Vibrio cholera epidemic strains arise, they spread, and then they sort of die out and they're overtaken. So there's very interesting selective pressures going on here that promotes the selection of these variants that my lab and many others are interested in. So in addition to the interesting temporal waves that we see, these waves follow a unique geographical pattern. So there's been a lot of work recently um, to look at isolates by whole genome sequencing that have been collected over a 100-year period. So we have isolates from the sixth pandemic as well as obviously from the seventh pandemic. We can compare those and we can see where they're all coming from. And what the overall conclusion of many of these groups of work that's summarized in the figure I made that is just an overly simplified diagram of this is that although local lineages of Vibrio cholera that are capable of causing disease, they have the right virulence um, genes, can emerge to cause disease, in those, endemic, in those regions, like in Africa and in um, South America, for example, 
they are not the ones that are responsible for the vast majority of disease. Rather, what happens is that those new variants emerge in areas proximal to the Bay of Bengal, and then they spread through human-mediated activity to those vulnerable regions. And this is particularly evident in an outbreak that happened, started in 2010 in Haiti. So you may have recalled there was a devastating earthquake in Haiti in 2010. This was a country that hadn't seen cholera in 100 years. And shortly after that outbreak, with a breakdown in infrastructure and a lot of vulnerable individuals, cholera was introduced inadvertently through a UN peacekeeper from Nepal. And that set off an outbreak that is still going on today that has resulted in nearly 900,000 cases, or just over 800,000 cases, 10,000 or so deaths. This was um, data from just up to November 2017, and just last year alone, 13,000 new cases. So unless the infrastructure is repaired, this organism has found its way into a great niche where it can continue to infect individuals and seed the aquatic reservoirs, and that's what it's going to do until that's fixed. So there are likely many factors that promote the evolution of new variants that can go on to spread globally. This is not simple. Obviously, there's host and environmental factors that can select for new variants that ultimately become enriched in local areas, both temporally and geographically, and then have the capacity to spread. So, in light of sort of a simple example, one would anticipate that in light of the fact that we've started using antibiotics to treat cholera, which is true, they're not explicitly necessary to treat cholera, but they are used routinely because you do decrease shedding of the organism and decrease um, disease severity, we see over time that Vibrio cholera isolates have increased in their antibiotic resistance. So this is data from a 2017 paper just recently published in Science showing the mean number of antibiotic resistance genes per isolate over time um, between 1980 and, and 2014. And you can see that in both Africa and Asia, the numbers of, of antibiotic resistance genes are increasing, not terribly surprising. When you look a little bit deeper at this, what becomes apparent is that like many bacterial pathogens, mobile genetic elements are playing a key role in the evolution of these um, resistance elements. So this is a schematic of one of the chromosomes of Vibrio cholera, which has two chromosomes. This is the large chromosome, the circle here, and then you see these lines with these bars going off. And these are all the different um, mobile genetic elements that can be found in different epidemic strains. One that is related to antibiotic resistance is this SXT element, which is an integrative conjugative element that was first described in a strain from India in the early 1990s. What we see when we look at the prevalence of SXT, which was named because it confers resistance to two drugs that were previously used to treat cholera, is that it first arose in, in Asian isolates and then quickly now has is, is gone to fixation basically in that population. And of course, um, SXT uh, carrying, element, carrying strains are also selected for in Africa since they're being spread to that region. So SXT can carry a, a wide variety of antibiotic resistance genes. Um, and so there's been five different SXT versions that have been identified in seventh pandemic circulating strains to date. So in terms of trying to understand the environmental factors that contribute to the evolution of new variants in this particularly important area surrounding the Bay of Bengal, um, I've been very interested in the role that phages play in selecting for epidemic variants. The reason that I'm interested in this is because um, approximately 100 years ago, Felix Durrell, who discovered bacteriophages, um, noted that in cholera patients in India, they were shedding these um, bacteriophages that could infect and kill Vibrio cholera in the, in the stool. And those same phages were found in the aquatic reservoir. So nearly 100 years ago, he hypothesized that phages were naturally controlling epidemics in these endemic regions. And um, more recently, in 2005, John Michelanos, in collaboration with Shah Farooq at the ICDDRB, which is a hospital located in Bangladesh, also noted that there, there was, pardon me, an inverse correlation between the level of disease that they were seeing in the endemic area of Bangladesh and the levels of phages in the aquatic reservoirs, suggesting that phages can quench the epidemic population and stop epidemics after they happen or, or before stop them from happening. This, of course, is a compelling hypothesis. 
We do not have good data to say that that's true. What we know for certain are that phages are there in aquatic reservoirs. They can infect and kill Vibrio cholera, so they can play a role potentially in environmental persistence. We also know that the phages are co-ingested with Fibrio cholera by infected individuals and can continue to prey on their bacterial host during disease in humans. And so we know then that these phages are shed in the stool and can potentially impact transmission, both dissemination into the aquatic reservoirs as well as transmission to other susceptible hosts. So as a postdoc, um, I worked in Andy Camilli's lab, and I was very fortunate in that he had a collaboration at the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh. Of course, this is located at the tip of the Bay of Bengal and is endemic for cholera. You get two repeating peaks of cholera every single year in Bangladesh. And this hospital sees thousands of cholera patients every year. And they have a fantastic collection of cholera stool samples that are archived from every 50th patient that have been seen there. And I was fortunate enough to gain access to this, um, to this collection of stool samples or a partial collection of the stool samples and just asked a very basic question which hadn't been asked before, which is what phages are there? We know they're there, but which ones? And so what we found was, was kind of surprising at the time. It still surprises me, actually. That is over a 10-year period, we only found three unique phages in those stool samples. So there's persistently three phages in those stool samples. We didn't find a huge diversity of phages, despite the fact that we looked at stool samples collected over a decade-long period. I named these phages for the hospital, so ICP-1, ICP-2, and ICP-3. These are unrelated phages, so I want to make that clear. We have multiple isolates collected over time of each of these, so we can track the evolution of a single phage over time. What has become apparent through this study and then being able to look back at the work that was done to characterize um, the inverse relationship between cholera and um, phages in the aquatic reservoir that was published in 2005 is that they were finding ICP-1 in aquatic reservoirs, so we know that it, it was there. That was based on their RFLP analysis and comparing our whole genome, whole genome sequencing to that. Afterwards, we, able, we were able to go to Haiti and look at strains that were circulating there after the epidemic started in 2010. We looked at stool samples from infected individuals in Haiti, and we only found ICP-2. So this was distinct from ICP-2 that we had found in Bangladesh, but it was very similar. Um, so it raises the compelling hypothesis that the phages were introduced by somebody um, in addition to Vibrio being introduced at that same time point. Um, metagenomic studies by other groups have confirmed that there are only three phages in their stool samples as well. So using metagenomics-based analysis, which is not biased for isolation-based techniques, they only find ICP-1, 2, and 3 in cholera patient stool samples from patients presenting to the clinic in Bangladesh, the same hospital where we were. And then there was a recent report by Shah Farooq's group, again, looking at 2001 up to 2015. They find ICP-1, um, ICP-2 uh, as well, I believe. And then we have an ongoing collaboration um, with an investigator at ICDDRB. We're collecting more stool samples. ICP-1 is still there. It's still evolving. And then I have a, a collaborator who sent me a stool sample from India. And this is from the western uh, coast of India, actually. And in that stool sample, which was contaminated by phage, um, was ICP-1. So the phage that we know that is circulating in India is the same one that's circulating in Bangladesh. So ICP-1 really is the dominant phage in stool samples from at least Bangladesh. And this is between this time period of 2001 to 2017. So this sets up a very interesting scenario where we know that the phage is capable of infecting and killing Vibrio cholera. It's persistent. It's there over long periods of time. And yet clearly cholera is there still. Vibrio cholera is there causing disease. So that sets up the scenario whereby we anticipate that we would be able to identify resistance mechanisms that Vibrio has evolved to defend against this phage, and then mechanisms that the phage has evolved to overcome those resistance barriers. So that's what we have set out to do. And just to give you a little bit more um, information on the mobile genetic element um, composition of epidemic strains, this was work that was published in 2009 by Rita Caldwell's group. This is just looking at 23 isolates that were collected over a 98-year period. And what is showing here in the large and small chromosome are all these different mobile genetic elements. There were 73 or so that they identified in the study. I already talked about SXT. 
And there's most of these mobile genetic elements that are just given numbers, in fact, have no known function, but like many mobile genetic elements, are likely to, cause a, to give a fitness advantage to their bacterial host in the right niche. So what we have found is that indeed mobile genetic elements are really important for epidemic strains to confer resistance against phages. And this um, mobile genetic element that we discovered and call a PLE, which stands for phage-inducible chromosomal island-like element, is really key to this process. So I'd like to go into some detail about how this element works. So the PLE, when I first discovered it, was isolated from a, a strain isolated from the ICDRB in, in 2011. And this, at the time, was a novel, novel element. Nobody sees something like that still to this day. We don't think that it's the same thing as in any other bacterial cells that we know of anyways, but it's possible. Um, most of the genes in this 18 KB element have no informative homology to anything, no conserved domains, full of hypotheticals. Like any mobile genetic element, it has clearly an integrase um, at one end. But otherwise, there's nothing about this element that you could look at the sequence and say it's conferring resistance to phage. So it doesn't carry CRISPR, it doesn't have restriction modification genes, and so on. So my lab is really interested in understanding the function of this element and how it's working to block phage because it's not a typical system that you can just look at the genes and understand it. So what I'm showing you here is the result of, of plea activity on ICP1 production per cell. So this is in Vibrio cholera that are otherwise completely isogenic. One lacks a plea and the other modified strain has a plea. And normally ICP1 can replicate in a single round of infection and produce 90 infectious phage particles within 20 minutes or so. And in plea positive cells, you get zero phages out. So it completely blocks the phage from replicating. And in the lab, you can screen 10 million phages any which way, and you will not get escaped phages. So it's really difficult for the phage to overcome this. And because we can't just get resistant mutants, it's become a little bit challenging to figure out how this element is working. So what we had noticed early on was that it seemed to be um, that the plea had specific activity against ICP-1 and was not working against these other circulating phages, ICP-2 or ICP-3, that again are unrelated genetically. So this is just a plaque assay, which is another way of looking at the ability of phage to infect. So the, the dark background is the bacterial lawn and the clear zones are the plaques where the phage have replicated and formed plaques. So here for ICP-1, of course, it's inhibited by a plea-positive vibrio. ICP-2 and ICP-3 are not. So we had no evidence that it could, it was a general phage defense mechanism. It seemed to be working against ICP-1. And it, perhaps there was molecular specificity underpinning this. So I'm going to go through sort of a stepwise model of how we think the plea is working without getting into sort of the nitty-gritty details about um, all the experiments that we did to show these things. So basically, the PLE resides integrated in the bacterial chromosome and the vibrio chromosome. ICP-1 can still infect and inject its DNA into these cells, so nothing is happening to the surface of the vibrio cholera to protect it against phage infection. The phage injects its DNA and starts its infectious cycle, which includes starting to replicate its genome, and its transcriptional program early at least seems to be totally normal. The PLE then senses this and is triggered in some way, both by excising from the chromosome, as well, it is transcriptionally activated. This happens, the transcriptional activation can be detected within minutes of phage infection, and so can excision. So the plea then, the excised plea, replicates to quite high copy number. Um, and then, at the end of the sort of what we know about the plea cycle, what happens is that the cell actually undergoes accelerated cell lysis. So in comparison to when ICP-1 is, is finishing its infection program, the cell lysis a little bit earlier. Um, and this is mediated by, we now know, um, at least one PLE-encoded product. So the PLE is also packaged. Our data is consistent with its stealing packaging material or structural components from ICP-1 so that it can be packaged into infectious virion-like particles. And these, uh, somehow, somewhere in here, there's um, complete inhibition of ICP-1 particles being produced. 
So we know that ICP-1 genome replication is decreased but not eliminated. We know that the accelerated cell lysis would decrease, probably decrease um, the uh, ability of ICP-1 to replicate but not eliminate it. So there's probably multiple redundant ways that the plea is acting to prevent ICP-1 from being able to replicate, which explains why in the lab we cannot just get escape mutants that overcome plea activity. So it's very difficult for the phage to do that. So because this individual cell dies, you may be thinking, why are you talking about this as a way to protect Vibrio cholera? Why did it evolve this? On a population level, if an individual infected cell dies, it acts as an abortive infection mechanism so that it doesn't spread virus to neighboring populations. So we think that this is how it's protected for populations, and we can demonstrate that very easily in the lab. So with this plea being packaged now, what we know happens, our data is consistent with these packaged plea particles being able to bind and infect recipient Vibrio cholera cells. It has the same receptor requirements as ICP-1 infection, consistent with its stealing packaging material from the phage. This packaged plea then can be um, injected into a recipient cell where it undergoes site-specific recombination into the Vibrio cholera chromosome. And then that cell becomes plea positive and the same thing goes on to happen should it be confronted by ICP-1. So we can demonstrate that in the lab. When we think about a little bit more about integration, um, we know that the plea encoded integrase, which is one of the only obvious um, gene products that are, is encoded on this island, we know that the plea encoded integrase would catalyze recombination between the circularized junction of the plea and the chromosomal at C site allowing for integration into the chromosome and the formation of hybrid left and right attachment sites. So at the beginning of the infectious cycle, when ICP-1 infects plea-positive cells, one of the first things that we know that happens is this excision event where plea excises from the chromosome. And based on the fact that the plea encodes this integrase, which is a large serine recombinase, we anticipate and know that it would um, it would require a recombination directionality factor that would allow the integrase to recognize these hybrid left and right attachment sites to catalyze excision. So integrase is still required, but it needs the right factor to promote that. Um, and so the, the RDF physically interacts with the integrase and catalyzes the excision from the chromosome. And now what we know, um, thanks to work that my graduate student Amelia just um, submitted and is under review but is posted on BioArchive, we know that this RDF is actually a phage encoded product that we have named PEXA. So PEXA is a small hypothetical protein, doesn't look like anything, no conserved domains, doesn't uh, exist in any other form in anything else except for ICP-1 phage, so it's unique to the phage, to ICP-1. And we know through in vitro um, and in vivo work that PEXA is necessary and sufficient for the integrase to stimulate excision of the plea from the chromosome. So this is how the, the plea is sort of getting a signal that it is infected, that the Vibrio cell that it's hosted in is infected by ICP-1 specifically. This explains one level to how ICP-1 triggers this event and no other phages that we've tested does trigger the, the excision event. So this defines one aspect of the molecular specificity. Um, there are many more levels to this probably, so transcriptional regulation seems to be just fine in the absence of this excision event. So the plea is still transcriptionally activated, it's getting other signals from the phage that we also anticipate will be unique to ICP-1, um, but we, we haven't quite figured those ones out yet. One thing I want to mention is that for the phage, this is bad, right? This triggers the mobilization of an antiphage element that will spread to neighboring cells and continue to kill you, right? So the phage doesn't encode this for the purpose of the plea. This is a gene that the phage needs. We've shown this through fitness assays. We don't know what it does, but we know that it's important for the phage. It's conserved in all ICP-1 isolates that we have over a 17-year period. So the phage needs it, and somehow the plea has evolved to recognize this product specifically so that it can sense ICP-1 infection, and ICP-1 can't get rid of it. And so, um, as I mentioned, this plea was first described, um, we first found this um, in, an, in an isolate from 2011 from ICDDRB. And of course, once we sort of knew a little bit more about the function, we were very interested in the prevalence of this 
in the prevalence of this um, mobile genetic element in isolates from, from Bangladesh. So what we did is look over time in these isolates between 2001 and at the time we had isolates to 2011 and we saw an increasing prevalence of PLE1 containing isolates in cholera patient stool samples from individuals presenting to the ICD-DRB. What was kind of surprising was that it wasn't just PLE1, but in fact we identified two variants at the time called PLE2 and PLE3 that have a similar genetic structure, and I'll talk a little bit more about the comparative genetic, genetics in the last slide. They are PLEs, they have different complement of genes, but they act in the same way. And PLE2 isolates were first identified in 2005 from the ICD-DRB, and PLE3 uh, isolates were first identified in 2008. And again, we see these sort of waves of PLE2 positive isolates, PLE3 positive isolates, all being overtaken by PLE1 positive isolates, which we now know are dominating in Bangladesh still to this day. And this was um, recently uh, work by Shah Farooq, sort of did the last four years of this graph and showed that indeed PLE1 positive isolates are now fixed in the clinical population for what is being presented at that hospital. So in light of the fact that others have sequenced isolates over now a 100-year period. We added our whole genome sequencing efforts to the whole genome sequencing efforts of many other groups. And now that there's approximately almost 12 or 1,300 Vibrio cholera isolates that have been sequenced over a 100-year long period, we can see that there's actually been a total of five plea variants that have existed in epidemic populations dating back as early as 1931. And so what we see are these five different pleas. When we compare them to each other, they share approximately half of their open reading frames. So they share a conserved set of genes that we would imagine are important for the function of this element. They all have an integrase. All of them, except for plea two, respond specifically to PEX-A. This is very exciting because plea five, for example, was first identified in a strain from 1931 from Iraq and it responds specifically to ICP-1, to PEX-A. So this suggests to us that although we aren't fortunate enough to have phages from the same time period, we are pretty confident that it probably means that ICP-1 was circulating at that time um, and was still exerting selective pressure that long ago. And so putting this into context with what I talked about with the sort of classical to LTOR transition and the waves of disease that we see, we see a very interesting temporal pattern that is consistent with these sort of waves that we see where, where um, a circulating strain dominates for a while and then is brought to extinction through, un through unknown means. PLE5 containing isolates are isolated between 1931 to 1995. PLE4 isolates then follow and so on. And interestingly, what we see is that they are not geographically restricted. And so I sort of mentioned this with the PLE5 strain from Iraq. What we know is that PLE2 and PLE3 strains in our data set and the, combined with the data sets of, of other groups, PLE2 and PLE3 strains are, are geographically restricted to Bangladesh. However, we now see PLE1 strains not just in Bangladesh but in, in Pakistan. And then PLE4 and PLE5 isolates, which are the oldest and presumably had the longest time to spread, are found in India and Africa and so on. There are no PLE positive isolates that we've identified from Haiti, for example. Okay, so I mentioned that ICP-1 persists in Bangladesh at least over a 17-year period, and yet I just told you that PLE eliminates ICP-1 and it's brought, been brought to fixation in the population of epidemic strains in the region. So how is that possible? What is ICP-1 doing to compensate for this highly effective resistance mechanism that's evolved in Vibrio? So um, what I'm showing you here is just a, a really quick schematic of how the data that I showed you where PLE blocks the phage completely, and because we had this collection of whole genome sequenced ICP-1 isolates over this pretty long time period, we were able to compare the genomes of ICP-1 isolates and look for ways in which the phage has compensated and co-evolved to overcome PLE. And what we found was pretty unexpected. Um, what we found was actually the first demonstration of a phage-encoded CRISPR-Cas system. So CRISPR-Cas is not just an editing um, technique or an editing tool. CRISPR-Cas is used by bacteria typically as a sequence-specific immune system to direct it against foreign nucleic acid for cleavage. 
In our system, it's, it's the exact opposite. The phage has hijacked a CRISPR-Cas system from an unknown source. We still don't know the source. We've sequenced now almost 1,300 Vibrio strains. None of them have uh, this CRISPR-Cas system, so we don't know where it got it from. Um, it's hijacked this CRISPR-Cas system, and it uses it to degrade, in a sequence-specific manner, degrade the plea. And this restores the phage's ability to replicate in plea-positive cells. So there's an ongoing coevolutionary arms race at play. This is obviously very interesting to us just from the perspective of basic biology in terms of understanding cholera evolution and the pressures that are causing Vibrio cholera to adapt and, and select for new variants. It's obviously very interesting. There's also a lot of effort to use phages as biocontrol agents in the treatment and prevention of disease, including for cholera, as you'll hear about in the next session. And of course, understanding how Vibrio resists phage in the context of human infection and how phages can sort of unexpectedly co-evolve is in a natural system, I think, very valuable to know what to expect should those um, studies ever come to fruition. So with that, I would like to thank my lab. Um, I have a great group of people who are all stacked in the fourth row of the auditorium, all staring me down. Um, so I'm very thankful to them. I'd like to thank also my previous lab member who um, was responsible for the PLOS Genetics paper. Um, and I would like, of course, to thank our funding and our collaborators. We've had many collaborators, both uh, as an independent investigator and through my work in Andy Camilli's lab as a postdoc. None of this would be possible if we didn't have international collaborators who are willing to share their isolates and work with us so that we could better understand this disease. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time.